Hey everyone, I'm Milan, a PhD student in Oxford, where we work on reduced precision simulations for weather and climate models. The future is 16-bit, at least for some parts of high-performance computing. The fastest supercomputers have just reached peak performances of half an exaflop with 64-bit double precision floats. Exascale, however, was already reached with 16-bit half precision a few years ago, thanks to GPUs. Many chip designers now develop processes that allow for less than 32-bit precision, mostly for machine learning applications. Machine learning and climate simulation have something in common. Both allow for imprecise calculations in large parts of the algorithms without a decrease in accuracy. But there's a whole zoo of 16-bit number formats, all with their advantages and disadvantages. Some are widely hardware supported, others are in early stages of their development. The precision of the various formats is here visualized in terms of the decimal places that are at least correct after rounding. Floats are basically a flat line on this graph as the exponent bits are evenly distributed in log space. Note the logarithmic x-axis. The little spike result is the significant bits are, in contrast, evenly distributed in linear space. Posits come with a pyramid-shaped decimal precision. They are a redesign of the floating point standard and provide more precision for numbers around 1 and less for very large and very small numbers. From the perspective of rounding errors, the best number format for a given application depends on the distribution of the underlying data. Integer or fixed point arithmetic may be considered for a uniform distribution, which has a triangular shape in this logarithmic plot. Floats are ideal for numbers that are log uniform distributed. Posits are better for numbers that are log normally distributed, which is better resembled by the pyramid shape. Additionally, rounder nearest can be replaced with stochastic rounding, which has been found to be superior in a range of applications. I've developed the corresponding stochastic rounding .jl package for that, check it out. Why do I use Julia for research with reduced precision number formats? The answer is type flexibility. Thanks to zero cost abstractions, we can write functions in Julia such that they get compiled to any number format T on the fly. In most cases, just define conversions and arithmetic operations for T. This comes with a huge advantage. I only have to write functions once and can simply plug and play new number formats or new rounding modes and Julia just does the rest for me. In this example, we can use any for number format T as long as the conversion from float64, addition and multiplication are defined. Even in more complex models, like a shallow water model with many, many functions, Julia allows us to write the top-level calling function with some types as arguments. These types will be passed on and used for different parts of the model, each part with its respective type-flexible functions. Here I'm using bfloat16 for most calculations, but float32 for the prognostic variables and posit8 for an API-like communication of variables across domains. Again, I can just plug and play number formats and analyze the result. In the left plot, posit16 was used for all calculations, whereas on the right, most calculations were done with bfloat16, but the accuracy critical parts are done with float32, an approach that is often called mixed precision. Today, I want to focus on how we can identify and hopefully overcome problems with 16-bit arithmetic in a given algorithm, and a climate model is only one possible application of this. So the questions I want to ask are, what numbers occur in an algorithm? Is the algorithm ready for 16-bit? And if not, where are the bottlenecks? Um, this led to the development of the package Sherlock's, and I want to illustrate in the following slides um, a few examples. Consider solving a linear equation system with LU decomposition of float 16 arithmetic. Now we wrap the float 16 type into a Sherlock. Sherlock 2, Sherlock 32 behave like float 32, but additionally lock the arithmetic result on every operation. The result is a bit pattern histogram, an array that tells us how often every float 16 number occurred in the algorithm. Addition for Sherlock's is just defined as a normal addition, but it also calls the function log it with a result before then actually returning it. The logbook can then be retrieved after completion, which contains for every number a counter of occurrences, which is the bit pattern histogram. In this example, flow 16.0 occurred more than a thousand times in the LU decomposition. We can understand the bit pattern histogram by plotting it. The histogram has all the bits from hexadecimal 0000 to FFFFF on the x-axis, but relabeled with their respective meaning as float 16. The histogram of input data, here given in blue, 
suggests that we actually don't need four of the 16 bits as its entropy h is only 12 bit. However, in the LU decomposition, positive as well as negative numbers are actually used, with most absolute values between 10 to the minus 3 and 4. This suggests that there is a negligible risk of over or underflow, and we could probably get away with fewer exponent bits. We also do not observe any huge spikes. The little ones result, as before, from the discontinuities between exponent and significant bits. In conclusion, this tells me that the LU decomposition, given random uniformly distributed data, is likely to provide satisfying results with float 16. We can apply the Sherlock number format also to the shallow water model from before. The result is quite different. With both float 16 and B float 16, there are huge spikes and we have to cut the y-axis to visualize the rest. B float 16 have likely too many exponent bits, which ideally could be traded in for significant bits instead. With float 16, we observe a large number of subnormals occurring in the simulations, likely suggesting that there is quite some underflow at play. Entropy suggests that float 16 is slightly better suited in this application than bfloat 16, which is indeed the case if you look at other analyses. Both formats yield satisfying results though, as you can see on the right. The huge spikes may suggest re recurrent rounding errors, but could also arise from recurrent calculations with variables that are actually constant. Is there a way that we can understand how and where they are caused? Yes, there is. To do that, Sherlock's also provide a number format of Watson, which doesn't lock the arithmetic results inside an algorithm, but saves the stack traces when a certain condition is met. Let's define a condition. For example, we want to know where numbers larger than a thousand are produced and run the shallow water model with Dr. Watson. Eventually, this warning arises and I usually just interrupt the, the execution as we sampled enough stack traces. Checking the first stack trace then tells us that the that the big spikes on the previous slide were caused by an addition in an interpolation function and even the line in which it happened. We can now investigate whether we should reorder operations in this line, for example. In this case, the spike actually can be removed by swapping a multiplication into an addition. This is uh, all work in progress that I use within my research and I'm more than welcome for any comment and suggestions.